Hey there. So we're looking at chapter 25, Cold War America, 1945-1963. So the Cold War began in 1945, uh, right after the end of the war, and it lasts until about 1991 uh, with the final collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, December 25th, 1991. So this chapter really focuses on the conflicts between the USSR the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the Soviet Union, or sometimes the Soviets, or sometimes I'll simply refer to them as the Russians. The Russian is the, Russia is the main, uh, it, it's a union of Soviet Socialist Republics, basically it's a union of, of multiple states. Uh, Russia is the leader, Russia is the most important figure. Um, so I sometimes call them that. So it's really about the conflict between the Soviets and the United States globally. Uh, we refer to this also East versus West, <clears throat> Eastern world, in this case, typically referring to communist uh, and those aligned with the communist and the West being the U.S. and those aligned with the United States. We look at changes in America and we will talk about JFK, uh, the Red Scare, things like that in this section. So containment is where we will begin. Cold War in Europe, 45 to 46. So the big three, Winston Churchill, FDR, Stalin, they met in early 1945 in Yalta. And there was a lot of discussions, but ultimately they did decide to create a United Nations. The United Nations debating the future of the world, uh, trying to decide how the post-world is going to, the post-war world would look like. Uh, they're not the only countries, but they are the ones that are making most of the decisions. They decide on the United Nations to create this. Uh, the United Nations was designed so it could uh, mediate issues, mediate differences, sort of an international police association as well, peacekeeping. Uh, it's far more effective than the League of Nations was after World War I, but still it's still not been nearly that effective or effective at all in some ways prohibiting global wars and catastrophes uh man-made uh, uh like humanitarian catastrophes things like that they create a security council which will be the core of the united nations the united nations will potentially be open to all countries but the security council will be the ones making most of the decisions Initially, the Security Council was just three, just these three countries, uh, England, America, Russia. And shortly after it was created, they added uh, two other countries, China and France. The argument being, I guess, these were the five biggest, most powerful countries in the world. And uh, the Security Council became five members who were the ones to make most of the major decisions. One of the things discussed also at Yalta was this desire by England and America, the West, for free and unfettered elections in Eastern Europe. In other words, once the war ended, the Soviets should pull back into the Soviet Union and all of Eastern Europe, which comprises 10 or 15 countries, should all be given free elections, allowed to determine their own course and destiny. The Soviets, however, counter this by arguing they need a Soviet sphere. They need a buffer zone between them and the rest of Europe. Because the Soviets are the ones that have suffered worse in every war in Europe in recent memory. And that is actually probably true. The majority of casualties in both World War I and II were Soviets. Uh, as many or far more Soviets died than, say, Jewish people in the war or any other country. So they had a good argument to be made that it was their country that was suffering. However, they're also ignoring the counter to that, and their country also benefited greatly from these wars. Uh, the Soviet Union came out stronger and more powerful after both conflicts. Uh, again, they, they walked away from World War I partway through. And this war, even though they had the greatest number of casualties, they still became a, an economic military powerhouse. Uh, maybe the most, probably the most powerful country in Europe, really. So 
they gained an awful lot from the war too, even though they also lost a lot. They wanted a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe where they wanted to, in essence, dominate or have influence over Eastern European countries and the West didn't want that. Obviously, these are entirely geopolitical reasons. Uh, the West didn't want the Soviets to have the influence over a dozen countries and have control over a dozen countries, obviously, because that would not be of the interest for Europe and the interest for the West. And, you know, the Soviets wanted it. So uh, many consider this USSR noncompliance. And USSR does not comply. In essence, all of Eastern Europe that the Soviet military had to roll through to get to the Germans, they stayed. They built military bases, they built walls, they built camps, they left military installations. In essence, all of Eastern Europe was now under the Soviet sphere. The Soviets controlled and dominated pretty much the entirety of the eastern half of the European continent for the next 50 years. Um, this noncompliance is often what we consider what started the Cold War. The Soviets' refusal to comply with all of this, and they simply stayed. This was the really the event that caused and created the Cold War. FDR died in April. Um, uh, Truman takes over. Truman immediately wants to go after Stalin. Not like war after Stalin, but he wants to stand up to Stalin. He wants to show Stalin that the U.S. will not be pushed around by the Soviets. Uh, certainly, certainly, probably the, the, the fact that at this point in 45, the two strongest countries in the world are certainly the U.S. and the Soviets. I think I don't think anyone would, would challenge that. So we wanted them to understand that we were going to counter any action they took. We were going to stand up against them. Um, uh, he constantly berated the Soviets. He was terribly harsh on them, which was maybe not the right strategy. The bluster, the arrogance, it made him, I guess, sound strong. But I don't know if it was necessary. Everyone understood the power of the U.S. We really had the most powerful military uh, in the Western world. And so I don't know if it was necessary. All he really did was piss off the Soviets and make him less likely to negotiate and work with us due to his, due to his anger and his... Uh, his vitriol. Uh, he was unwilling to negotiate. There was another conference in Potsdam in July of 45, and Truman was unwilling to even negotiate or really discuss options with the Soviets. It was simply all or nothing. They needed to back out of Eastern Europe and, and walk away and, and get back into the country and leave everything alone. And yeah, the Soviets did not do that. Now, Truman had a lot of confidence because of the bomb. We had the bomb. He wasn't Again, we had no reason to really be afraid of the Soviets, for certain. But, yeah, he was uh, he was maybe overconfident. And I don't know if I said it in the last chapter. I think I might have. One of the reasons we think Truman dropped the bomb was simply to demonstrate to the world, especially the Soviets, that we had it and that we were willing to use it. And that if they tried to come after us, we'd simply use it on them. Um, also, you know, we knew they were working on a bomb, too. Several countries were. Uh, it wasn't just the U.S. We got to it first, but. American politicians really wanted to rebuild Germany. We really decided that there was a huge mistake made at the end of World War I where we didn't rebuild Germany. It was all about reparations and, and uh, hurting Germany. And people understood that. Uh, it took a generation to figure it out. Um, so the economy was a priority. In essence, build up Germany because we know what caused World War II was the Credible Depression, which allows someone like Hitler to rise to power. So they wanted to build up the economy. Germany was, uh, in Central Europe, maybe the, the biggest industrial economy in Europe, uh, other than the Soviets. Uh, and of course, much of the Soviet was actually in Asia. Uh, you know, they wanted to give stability to avoid someone like Hitler rising up again. Stalin, however, simply wanted reparations. In essence, the same thing France and England wanted from Germany in World War I, Stalin wanted World War II. He wanted reparations, he wanted money, he wanted machines, he wanted goods, he wanted factories, he wanted the mines, he wanted the oil fields. All he wanted was to drain Germany dry for the tragedy, for the what they did. American, British, and French troops occupied Germany and Berlin. Uh, Soviet troops uh, occupied Germany. We do what's called the partition of Germany. Western Germany, we cut Germany in half. Western Germany is broken up into three parts, England, France, and the U.S. govern each part initially. 
Uh, same thing with Berlin. And then the eastern part is governed by the Soviets. Uh, so each of these four zones is occupied, and ultimately there's minimal reparations given to anyone or taken by anyone. So uh, Germany simply doesn't have it to give, really, at least, at least for the West. Um, the Soviets wanted that, though. Uh, you look at this picture and you have to wonder, I mean, that's a good discussion question to think about. Who are these people? This is this is Germany. This is in Germany, by the way. But I mean, look at the, look what German cities. Most German cities on the north and the west side of Germany look like this. Uh, half of Germany is just in ruins. How do you even where do you begin to recover from this? How do you do your daily lives? These folks are dressed up nicely. Maybe it's a, hol a holy day, a religious day for them. Uh, now, people did dress a lot nicer back then. I mean, hell, people would sometimes wear ties to work in factories uh, in this time period still. So, you know, but still, they look like they're dressed nicer. Uh, that, that, that cart looks like it's full of wood, maybe. What could they be using the wood for? What do you think? Um, where do you start to rebuild if you're a regular citizen and your government's in shambles? You just a war just ended. Uh, your your country's occupied by multiple people from other countries that all claim dominance over your country, and you've now been the cause of two world wars in a row, in in less than twenty years or twenty years or so. So, what kind of life do you have now? Where does your life go? I'm on unemployment, fifty percent. I mean, it's uh, how do you even put food on the table? So think about that. Think about what it will be like for these three folks. It looks like a husband, a wife, or maybe even a father, a daughter, and maybe a granddaughter here. Uh, what are they doing? Where are they going? Think about what were they doing before they came into the picture? What, where were they at gathering up this wood, if that's what it is, and where are they going? And What's life like for them now? Should be noted in most of this, this, you know, the common regular people didn't wage war on other countries. The government did this. The government en did this, enlisted the soldiers, and then fought a war. I don't know how much blame has to fall on regular German citizens. Debatable. There's a lot of debate about it. The containment strategy. So in response to the Soviets' refusal to leave Eastern Europe, America decides it must contain communist power to avoid spread of communism around the world. This is known as the containment strategy. We must contain the communists. In 1946, we have Ambassador, Ambassador George F. Kennan. He's in Moscow. Kennan in Moscow calls for containment of, uh, quote, containment of Russian expansive tendencies. He believes Russia has no de has the desire for nothing less than continue to expand and grow and to grow the USSR, to add more countries to the Soviet sphere, and to spread, uh, in some people's words, like a plague across Europe and Asia. Uh, and the Soviets have the military power and the population to do it, so and the will, it seems. And he believes that the Soviet system will collapse if we oppose it at every opportunity. In other words, for the Soviet Union to continue and grow and prosper, it has to keep absorbing new territories. It has to keep in bringing new people and resources and money. If we can ever stop it from growing, it will collapse in upon itself. It will eat itself up. That's sort of the strategy he, George Kennan, suggests. Truman takes this to heart. Uh, Truman issues um, the Truman Doctrine in 1947. And the Truman Doctrine says, and again, in summation, in, in very simplest forms, that we have to oppose communism around the globe and that we will support anywhere in the, in the world that chooses or decides to try and resist oppression by an outside force or even an internal force, say, like an uprising of communism in their country, like a political faction that tries to take over. So anywhere where you have a, a minority inside your country that tries to take over the majority, that in some way aligns itself with communism or socialism, or outside influence. The US will come to your aid, they'll assist, all in our goal to fight and resist the Soviet Union around the world. 
um, that we must, as Americans, we must resist. Uh, we must resist and uh, assist. Very quickly, he suggests assistance for countries like um, countries like Greece and Turkey. Greece and Turkey are both countries that are that are close to the Soviets. I think Turkey actually borders the Soviet Union. Uh, and we he suggests we need to send military aid and money. Well, in addition to this, uh, George Marshall, I believe that's his name. I think it's George Marshall. Uh, comes up with what we call the Marshall Plan. It's named after him, or he he, he proposes it. And the Marshall Plan is 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 to work in conjunction with the Truman Doctrine. We are going to give money and aid to Europe. In other words, we are going to show Europe we are your friends. We're going to help you. We're going to give you money. We're going to give you assistance. We're going to help you rebuild your economies. Because you know, even though we've really been talking about Germany here, all of Europe was damaged, decimated. I mean, this was a war that covered the entire continent. So. Uh, we're going to give money to anyone who wants it, anyone who needs it. We're going to give assistance. We'll send to the military. All you got to do is ask, and we'll come running with money in hand. Um, and we also tell Eastern Europeans to do the same thing. We'll help you in Eastern Europe under the Soviet sphere. All you have to do is reject the Soviets and tell the Soviets to get out of your country, and we will come and assist you if you reject Soviets, Soviet influence. No Eastern European countries get aid. Because almost immediately after the war, the Soviets institute a, a pretty much a political lockdown of every country. They take over, they, they, they militarily um, uh, occupy pretty much every country in Eastern Europe. So your Eastern your Europe really gets nothing from us. No aid, no assistance. Um, uh, we gave over $13 billion over the next few years. $13 billion at the time was, was quite a lot. We gave over $13 billion to the Marshall Plan to, to rebuild Western Europe. Uh, and ultimately, we get Western Europe to look west, look to us as leaders, uh, which they do for most of the rest of the 20th century. Whenever there's a problem, they need assistance, they call the US and we usually come running. Well, Eastern Europe looks to the east. Eastern Europe primarily looks to the Soviet Union for assistance. And all the Soviet Union ever gives is oppression, exploitation, uh, murder, death, and violence. Um, and we now have this new East-West paradigm which exists for just about the rest of the 20th century. East led by the Soviets, West led by the US, uh, the idea over here was freedom, democracy, equality, economic rights, capitalism. And the Soviet Union was about communism, socialist policy, and dominance by military authoritarian elites. And that dominates for most of the rest of the century. No agreement to reunify Germany, of course. Germany stays split. We get a permanent Eastern Germany and Western Germany for at least 50 years. We get two separate countries. Uh, the Western Germany, we, they start calling themselves Democratic Republic of West Germany. Um, Eastern Germany takes a similar name, sort of a Democratic Republic, a very similar name to that. It's not. There's no Democratic Republic. Eastern Germany is entirely under the authority of uh, the Soviets. But they like to pretend like they're some sort of Democratic Republic. They're not. Western Germany, after only a few years, we leave. We're in Western Germany only for a couple of years to help them get rebuilt, and then we bail completely, and, and they become a successful, thriving country uh, with our military or with our economic assistance. Um, initially, though, we're there for several years to assure, probably more than anything, even though we claim it's about trying to help Germany rebuild, and we do do that. Again, Germany, in just 20 years, Germany becomes maybe the most prosperous country in Europe, um, or what, one of the most prosperous countries in Europe in large part to our assistance. Initially, the first couple of years, though, we stay there solely uh, to protect Western Germany from Soviets. We fear that if we leave Western Germany, the Soviets might simply march over and take it over too. Uh, and what are we going to do to stop them? So for much of those, those first few years, we stay there to protect West from the East. Uh, in response to this, in 1948, Stalin blockades Berlin. Remember, Berlin is, is, is also partitioned. But here's where Berlin is. Geographically, Berlin is in East. So Berlin, which has which is partly controlled by the West, is actually in East Germany, surrounded by Soviets. 
So the Soviets surround it, they, they blockade it, they cut off the, line, the trade lines, the access lines, and uh, we see British and American pilots continue to, uh, to airlift, what's called the Berlin Airlift. For the next year, they airlift tons and tons of food, supplies, water, uh, fuel into the city, which is, which is completely cut off. And we do this for around a year. Uh, some planes are shot down, a handful of planes are shot down, although the Soviets could have probably shot down every plane if they really wanted to. But to have done that, of course, would have to really been really aggressive and sh sh shoot down all the American and British planes would, of course, been an act of war. So most planes got through, uh, most supplies got through, and the Soviets finally understand that this is really becoming a very, um, it becomes a PR nightmare for them. Because they want to proclaim themselves, they want to portray themselves as heroes as well. The same way the U.S. is portraying itself as a hero coming to your rescue if you need help, uh, and the U.S. is doing that. The Soviets want to pretend that too. They want to say that they are the heroes. They want to act like this. And what they're doing here is costing people's lives and so much national, international pressure, pressure from the United Nations. Eventually, the Soviets lift, give, give it up. They walk away and they stop the blockade. and the roads and the train lines are reestablished. Uh, we also begin NATO in this period. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is begun in this period. Initially, it only has, what, about a dozen countries? U.S., Canada, Britain, France, Italy, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, a little bitty country in Europe, uh, Denmark, Norway, some Scandinavian countries, Portugal, Ireland, so initially, it's just around a dozen countries or so. It eventually expands to be, I don't know, 30, 40 or more countries. Now, what is the purpose of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? Really, it's for mutual defense and protection for an attack from the Soviets. So in other words, we're all allies with each other. So if the Soviets were to attack or invade or try to manipulate any of these countries that is listed, the other countries would come to its assistance. Uh, so it's for mutual benefit and assistance regarding the Soviet Union. These are all countries which, in essence, are pledging to uh, contain and resist Soviet influence. Um, and they want protection from the U.S. more than anything. Well, so the Soviets do the same thing. They create the Warsaw Pact. Uh, Warsaw, which I think is uh, well, Poland, I believe. So it's based on Warsaw. Um, uh, you know, Maybe they consider Poland to be sort of their the center because it is in, it is in Eastern Europe. So it is the center of much of, of their power. I mean, all the power, honestly, is in Moscow. But geographically, when you consider Europe, Poland has a centralized uh, location there. Uh, the, the Warsaw Pact is the same thing. Uh, all these Eastern European countries are going to defend themselves from aggression from uh, the Americans in the West and NATO. So by 1948, we have a very clear East versus West. Um, oh, and the Iron Curtain also is here. Pretty much all of, e if you've ever heard that term, all Eastern European countries now under the Iron Curtain. This Iron Curtain, which implies the dominance and the influence of the Soviets. It gets more complicated in 1949. Because in 1949, USSR announces that it has the bomb. So now we have the bomb and they have the bomb. We both have the ability to drop uh, massive atomic bombs and wipe out entire cities in an instant uh, against each other. They have it. We have it. Uh, they detonated and tested an atomic bomb. In response, the National Security Council, don't confuse this with uh, UN, this is the United States National Security Council, uh, issues a resolution, uh, a report, I should say, NSC 68. Uh, they encourage the development of a new bomb. They encourage the development of a new bomb, and guess what? In 1954, we have a new bomb. We start calling the H bomb, the hydrogen bomb. It uses different technology. The atomic bomb was, uh, I believe, splitting the atom, and the H-bomb is um, combining atoms. In other words, one is uh, fission, split, the other is fusion. Uh, the fusion bomb is a thousand times greater than the atomic bomb. Uh, a couple of fusion bombs dropped on Japan would have wiped out half the island, would have wiped out half the entire Japanese population. This bomb is a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb. Much, much bigger, more powerful. Um, and just a few years after that, Soviets have one too. Uh, we know one of the reasons Soviets got such technology so quickly is they had spies in our government. 
we know they had spies in our, in our government. Well, we probably had spies in there too. I don't, I don't know what probably. So we know they stole a lot of technologies from us. Nonetheless, we all had spies on each other. Um, this is around, I don't really talk about it here, but this is around the time the CIA was created, Central Intelligence Agency, created specifically uh, to do with containment and uh, Soviet aggression, to deal with all the, the secret stuff behind the scenes, espionage stuff dealing with the Soviets. That was our purpose in creating the CIA. So we create one, they create one, we get a bigger one, they create a bigger one. And so the trend begins. Uh, we get a bigger bomb, they get a bigger bomb. We have a bigger plane, they get a bigger plane. We get a bigger tank, they get a bigger tank, and so on. And that escalates through pretty much the entire rest of the century. This shows you the Soviet Union, which is all these Soviet socialist republics. Now, don't, don't be confused. All these here are not part of the Soviet Union. These are, these are technically independent European countries. Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Hungary, Czech. Eastern Germany, Poland, technically, they're independent European countries. The Soviet Union actually includes other little little independent states all through here that are not just, they're not separate on a map. The Soviet Union shows itself as one country, but it claims to be a republic of about, uh, what, about 12 or 15 different republics, 12 or 15 different small states, which actually does happen. When the Soviet Union collapses, it breaks apart into about 12, 12 different countries. Uh, uh, but it's the Soviet Union, uh, which is based in Moscow, and they're making, they're really pulling all the strings for Eastern Europe. So you have the green countries, which are allied with us in the West, the purple countries allied with the Soviets, and then you have the, the tan ones or the neutral countries. Ultimately, most of these tan countries end, uh, end up allying with us. Most of these end up allying with NATO. Uh, most do. But at this point in time, this is out of 1955. 1955. Here's an idea of what Europe looks like now. East versus West split right down the middle behind the Iron Curtain with Germany split in half. And Berlin, as I just mentioned, is actually in Eastern Germany, even though half of Berlin is considered West and stays under the authority. And here you see the partition here. The whole country really looks like this, but you see the partition of West Germany with the three countries, East Germany under the authority of the Soviets. And the Berlin Wall, although it hasn't built yet, that's not built until the 60s. All right, let's look at containment in Asia. Asia is the first great test of Truman's doctrine and the containment policy. And we fail. We fail miserably. Uh, yeah, we, we fail. Not 100% failure, but it's, uh, yeah, it's enough. We get enough on this. Communist forces led by Mao Zedong uh, challenged democratic forces. There was democratic, was known as the nationalist forces. We have democratic nationalist forces. We have Mao Zedong's communist forces. They are challenging for control of the country. From 1945 to 1949, we gave billions of dollars to China's nationalist forces, attempting to support China, um, defending itself against Mao's uh, communist minority. Eventually, uh, Mao is is actually defeated. I believe in the 30s. I mean, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit there. In the 30s, Mao is actually defeated once, and he disappears. Uh, he, they weren't sure they killed him. They're sure what happened to him. He simply disappears for several years. Um, then in the 40s, he reappears again with an army, sort of out of nowhere in northern China. Uh, with thousands of men working for him. In essence, it was like a guerrilla army he created. He, he went up to the mountains in northern China and hid out and built an army and, and, and probably got assistance from the Soviets. Probably got assistance from the Soviets. And then in 45, he launches an all-out attack uh, to try and take over China. And this is exactly what the Truman Doctrine said. We will give money and supplies and resources to help anyone try to resist subjugation and authoritarian dominance by an armed minority. That's exactly what it was with Mao. We gave billions of dollars. Finally, in 1945, the decision is made in the U.S. to cut off aid to China, realizing very clearly there are only two alternatives, either walk away from China or invade. We gave billions of dollars and Mao continued to grow and expand and gain power and continue to take over parts of China. And so there really was no option. 
uh, either either walk away or invade and start a war uh, in China. And we knew Mao was being supported by the Soviets. So there was lots of concerns about getting into a war with the Soviets and getting into another war when really we really had just started to recover from in the last war. We chose to walk away and uh, we could not save China. China was eventually Mao takes over and wins and conquers. Uh, he conquers uh, China and China is lost. And today, seven years later, China is a very uh, totalitarian, authoritarian, communist state. Very much so. Very much like Russia. Uh, they're, they're different, but they're both authoritarian, communist states. Um, we lost China. Very simple. But to have to have to have had any chance of saving China would have had to have been a military occupation, military invasion, which might have actually put us into war with China and with the Soviets. And we weren't willing to do that yet at this time. So we lost China. Uh, so our, our first really big challenge to containment and the, the Truman Doctrine is a failure. Hey, the big challenge. We had some small stuff like Turkey. We were successful in Turkey. We gave money and assistance to Turkey. We held on to Berlin. We we protected Western Germany. Uh, we protected Greece and eventually helped Greece get independence and freedom. So we had some small victories. But if you put all those things together, China is still a hundred times bigger than all those together. So uh, we had a few small victories, but we lost the biggest game of this time period. Um, and I don't only mean like game, but it really this was sort of like this was sort of like a global um, risk game of risk. It really was. Uh, many many people died through all this. The Korean War, 1950. Truman gets another chance to enact his doctrine and to take action. Truman uh, was was elected uh, uh, 1948. He won the election. Pardon me. Um, so he gets another opportunity to act. He won't let it pass. He wants to stop communism. Korea. In a nutshell, Korea is a, uh, a, a peninsula off of China. China is now communist. China, with assistance of the Soviets, is giving money and aid to North Korea, the region of North Korea. It's, it's really all one country at this point. But um, assistance to Northern Korea communists to invade and take over the entire peninsula. Really would have put the whole peninsula under the authority of the Chinese. Uh, now, the Koreans and the Chinese didn't get along. They've been at odds forever, but they had this, this upstart uh, in Korea, this upstart uh, military uh, sort of dictator. And anyway, uh, we decide we're going to intervene and we're going to save Korea. Um, at the end of World War II, we'd actually divided Korea along the 38th parallel. I don't know if it was officially two countries. But what we did was we did the same thing as in Germany. We divided Germany in half, and Eastern Germany was under the Soviet sphere. Western Germany was under the uh, American sphere. Well, Korea, we do the same thing. We divide it in half. Northern Germany is under the Chinese sphere, and uh, uh, Northern Korea is under the Chinese sphere, and Southern Korea is under the U.S. sphere. We are there protecting, trying to protect South Korea. South Korea wasn't trying to take over North Korea. North Korea was trying to take over South Korea. Uh, there was a desire to unify the country, and um, there was a desire to do this. Stalin gives assistance to Mao, and Mao and Stalin together, along with North Korean communists, decide they are going to unify the country, all under communist rule. The U.S. creates a peacekeeping force, along with assistance of the U.N. The U.N. and the U.S. create a peacekeeping force in South Korea to defend it from the, the northern uh, uh, communist aggression. Um, primarily, it was, it was just U.S. forces. Initially, Korea was just U.S. forces. Um, uh, my, my grandfather was in Korea um, during this time period. So U.S. forces protecting and defending Korea. Um, war began when the Chinese actually responded to General MacArthur. What? The actual Korean War began when MacArthur landed uh, MacArthur landed right on the edge of the 38th parallel on the South Korean side and almost immediately launched an all-out invasion of North Korea, unprovoked and unsanctioned by the U.S. government. 
he he said later he saw an opportunity, so he went for it, and he took his military troops, which had landed there in North, in South Korea, on a peacekeeping mission and invaded North Korea. An act of war. Uh, he invades North Korea and he pushes uh, the enemy troops all the way up to the border of China, actually right up to the border of China, and MacArthur started to have run-ins with Chinese military. So this peacekeeping force in South Korea almost turned into a global war uh, of the U.S. versus China and the Soviets. <laughs> exactly what we wanted to avoid in China in 49, we almost walk right into in 1950 as a result of MacArthur's actions. China responds and launches an attack. Um, so China launches an attack through North Korea against the American troops, pushing them all the way back down to the tip of South Korea. It really was almost a total unmitigated disaster. Uh, MacArthur was relieved of duty for doing this. He was relieved of his command for doing this. It was uh, a huge mistake on his part, uh, which was such a shame too for such a decorated, you know, decorated officer and 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 general. He was. Uh, it was a hero of World War II, uh, and then he makes this terrible mistake um, here. Uh, yeah. Nonetheless, the war then lasts for about three years. Uh, by the way, you should know, think about how many wars we fought. I, you know, I mean, you know, off the top of your head, how many times we've been in war in the last 70 years? I know. Europe and Asia and Africa and Central America and man, all these other places we've been in the Middle East. This, I believe, if I'm correct, I, I mean, you can look it up, but I believe I'm correct. This is the actual last official declared war in the United States by Congress. This is the last time Congress officially declared war was Korea, seven years ago. And yet, you could argue we have been in constant war ever since. Policemen of the world, some people call us, because we believe we're going we're gonna to go out there and keep the peace around the whole world anywhere and everywhere. Um, and we do almost always go in as a peacekeeping force, which very often escalates into all out warfare, where thousands and tens of thousands of Americans lose their lives, but yet, yeah, it's interesting. 1953, the war officially ends and they declare peace. They uh, create two separate countries, North and South Korea. And it's been that way ever since. And look at where we are today. What is sometimes thought to be the most oppressive and exploitive and military dictatorship on the globe is North Korea. And South Korea is a democratic republic. Uh, an ally of ours. South Korea is a close ally of the U.S., democratic republic. And North Korea is, is one of the worst places to live in the world. Uh, under the most oppressive governments in the world. So this is a 50% success. We saved South Korea and lost North Korea. What's really amazing is how much this still affects us today. I mean, look at look today. Soviet Union is still communist. China, communist. North Korea, communist. Um, uh, 70 years later, and it's we're deal, dealing, it's almost like it was yesterday. This shows, uh, oh, oh, I should mention that, yeah. Defense spending rises to two-thirds of the U.S. budget during the war. Two-thirds of the entire U.S. budget, the U.S. Uh, budget, and that, that word's communism that might be cut off there. Two-thirds of the entire U.S. budget is defense spending. And this also becomes the number one expenditure of the U.S. government uh, forever, until today. The number one expenditure of the United States government until today is still Today, we use the term national defense, uh, fighting the war on terrorism and things like that. Uh, biggest expenditure, which should make a very specific point of if all the money is being spent on the military, what are we not spending money on? Social services, uh, poverty, uh, low wages, national health care, um, you name it. We spend more of our money on global warfare and defense and less of our money on our people. Uh, hundreds of thousands of homeless people in America. 20% of the entire American population living in poverty. Imagine how much better off we would be if we took those trillions of dollars we spend every single year, trillions and trillions, 
on national defense and if we diverted even a portion of that money to social services and welfare in America. Nonetheless, we don't. Um, in 1953 alone, the U.S. budget uh, was $50 billion for uh, national defense. $50 billion national defense. All supposedly and really it is to fight national to fight global communism. Another thing we should look at: some people compared made made comparisons of Stalin to Hitler. Uh, the idea of um, Hitler's appeasement, the fact that we kept giving in to Hitler year after year in the 30s, is really what led to World War II. Hitler got bigger and bigger and more powerful and more dominant and more brazen. Uh, the fact that we just kept giving in and appeasing him, which of course leads to global catastrophe. Some people make that analogy here. They make the analogy of what's happening, um, uh, and it's the Munich Conference, the 1938 Munich Conference, where we, in essence, told Hitler uh, uh, he could have everything you've taken so far, you just have it, we'll let you do everything you've done, and we'll overlook it if you just stop. And many people make that analogy to Stalin and say, well, if we keep giving in Stalin and keep telling Stalin, well, hey, you know, do whatever you want, just stop, uh, Stalin's just going to keep doing it. Um, it's going to lead to further and further war. Pardon me. Instead, we continue to resist. We continue to use a containment strategy. We give resistance in Germany, Greece, Iran, Iran, uh, Guatemala, Vietnam, um, Turkey, pretty much anywhere in the world that the Soviets think they, or we think the Soviets have influence, we are going to assist and give money. Uh, anywhere we can resist their militaristic oppressive tendencies. Uh, and it should be noted, in some of these countries, the government that arises is actually worse, maybe even than the Soviets. Some of these countries turn into two terrible totalitarian dictatorships. Some countries get run by warlords. And some of these countries, the people who put in power, like Vietnam, for instance, the guy who put in power in Vietnam was a monster, murders thousands of his own people, executes a mass execution. I mean, he was terrible. He was, he was evil. Um, we put him there. We didn't do it knowing he was evil, but we didn't seem to care at the time because all that mattered was he wasn't communist. This is Mao in the middle. He's a Soviet uh, army, the Soviet uh, People's Republic. Is that, what they're, is that what they're called? The People's Army, I think, is what they call it. Weird irony there. Uh, the army designed to keep down the people, People's Army. So we have the Mao here. These are, I don't know, maybe some of his, I don't know who the two guys on either side are. Uh, symbol of the communism, Communist Party right there. And uh, yeah. 1949, uh, after his, his second attempt to take over China, he is successful. Communist propaganda. Korean War. Well, what's different about this picture? What's different about this picture? Think about that. Um, black and white men in the same foxhole. It's called a foxhole. You, you dug dug a hole and you were able to hunker down and, and hide and sort of uh, blend in with the terrain uh, to hide from enemy aircraft, enemy espionage, uh, bullets, ever anything. You'd hide down the foxhole. Here he is with a machine gun and I don't know, M60 maybe. Don't yeah, I'm not sure. Um, what's different? Black and white men in the same unit. Truman. Uh, as a reward to African Americans and our, their service in World War II, uh, both in military and civilian service, he desegregates. He tries to desegregate many aspects of American society. He actually is, in many ways, Truman is probably our first civil rights president. He has limited effect, but he does several significant things. We'll really talk about those in chapter, eh, a little bit in 26, mostly 27. Um, but uh, he does this in 1947. He desegregates the military. He opens up the military to allow black and whites to serve together in the same units. He also uh, promotes multiple black officers. Uh, we see some of the, the first African-American high-ranking military officers in America under Truman's presidency. So he's president from, what, 45 until, I guess, 52, right? 45 to 52. 
uh, well, again, technically, you don't leave waffles till 53. I just rounded off to the even years. North Korea, South Korea here, 38th parallel. This is where he landed. Um, immediately invades, invades North Korea. The Chinese respond, pushing him all the way back down here to this little corner. I believe he gets pushed all the way back down to this little corner right here. Uh, this happens pretty quick. This all happens just a couple of months. Um, it's ugly. Uh, 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 the war ends. Uh, the armistice line of July 7, 1953. And today we call this region uh, the demilitarized zone, the DMZ. It is the most uh, militarized border in the world, often quoted as. Uh, it's, it's a big empty zone full of millions of mines that separate North and South Korea covered by at least, I think last I read, like at least 500 soldiers on both sides are constantly on this border. Uh, and there's multiple military bases on both sides. In essence, it looks like a battleground, a constant readiness for warfare between North and South Korea, ready to fight and, and kill each other at an instant. And I don't believe it's ever been breached. I don't believe there's ever been a breach of, of the demilitarized zone between them. I'm not saying no one has ever gotten across. I'm just saying there's been no actual war between North and South Korea, I don't believe, ever since the end of the war in 53. North and South Korea, yeah. The DMZ. Interesting. Uh, I haven't talked about it yet, but it's going to be probably the next thing I get into. I'm going to start talking about, I won't get into it quite yet, but I'll talk about it soon. The uh, military industrial complex, which really begins uh, in World War II. It's this partnership between private industry and the U.S. military, the State Department, um, pardon me, not State Department, the Department of Defense. So between the Department of Defense and private industry, remember we, mo we mobilized all private industry, the War Industries Board in World War II to produce all military goods. Well, up to World War II, we did not have a standing large military. Never, we never had a standing large. Even after World War I, we drew down. World War I, we, we un unenlisted most of the military. So, and we had the big drawdown after one. Well, after World War II, it never happens. We never have the drawdown again because of the containment in the Soviets. So we continue to have a very large military, well, forever. Uh, today, I think there's, what, 2 million people in the U.S. military, give or take. And that's, that's I think, full time. It doesn't include all of your, your reservists and all your National Guards and, and, and of course, the tens of millions of retired military. So, uh, anyway, uh, this relationship between private and government to build all these military goods, weapons, bombs, tanks, planes, all kinds of new research technology, universities, all this kind of stuff. This military industrial complex continues to grow and thrive in America, and it becomes so big. In the 1950s, one seventh of all Americans, one seventh of all working Americans, are working in the military industrial complex. It is it is a core of the American middle class. It is a core of the American uh, prosperity of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, uh, growth of unions in America. I mean, these unions are at these private factories. Uh, this right here just shows Southern California, for instance. This is Los Angeles and Orange County. This was one of the hubs of the military industrial complex in America. Uh, LA, Long Beach, Orange County, all that entire region. Look at all these. All these blue dots are all these all these uh, private factories that are all working for with government contracts. Um, all the military bases, these red marks are all like military bases, military facilities. Many of these still there. These are down around like Seal Beach and, um, and uh, I'm trying to think what the name of the other region is down there right next to Seal Beach. So you have all this stuff still down there, and, and this is uh, Orange County and Long Beach, all these military bases, airfields. At one point, uh, all of Southern California between San Diego and Los Angeles had over 100 different military facilities between military bases, airfields, all this kind of stuff. You know, if the bombs ever did drop and the, the, the nukes ever did actually go, Southern California is going to be wiped, off, wiped, wiped out. So, you know, us that live in Southern California, we're going to be the first to go. Because even today, there's still dozens of military bases, ordnance facilities. Those are what make bombs and explosives. Uh, and of course, lots of factories that still produce military goods. I mean, think like Boeing and like the jets. And I mean, it's, yeah. 
if the bombs drop and everything from LA to San Diego is just going to go up in a puff of, and we're all gone. So we don't have to worry about the apocalypse, uh, the post-nuclear apocalypse, because we will, we won't we'll see it. Um, so it's interesting to think about, uh, not something to dwell on. As we're going to talk about in the coming chapter, everybody dwelled on the coming nuclear apocalypse in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It was part of American culture, uh, the idea of when were the bombs going to drop. Not if, but when were the bombs going to drop. After several decades, people stopped worrying about it. Um, however, it should be noted, it could still happen at any time. There's, there's something like seven or 8,000 nuclear weapons in the world today that are armed and potential to be used or sitting in storage somewhere that they could be put on a missile at a short notice. So, you know, every second of every day could be the end of it. But again, you can't dwell on it. No. Cold War liberalism. Truman and the end of reform. Um, FDR social welfare programs really start to disappear in the 50s. Some of them are stay. I mean, like Social Security, for instance. Some of them do stay. But many of the welfare, social welfare programs that FDR created in the 30s and the 40s to save America from the Depression, many of them start to go away and they're not renewed. The way it often works, most... Um, most laws that involve expenditures of money through the government have expiration dates. Some people don't know this. Most laws that involve any type of expenditure from the government have an actual date that they will end, most of them, which requires on a regular basis, Congress has to renew these laws if they are involving government expenditures. Many of these laws, which were instituted under FDR, Congress does not renew in the late 40s and 50s. Truman hoped for this huge expansion. Truman hoped for a big expansion. He actually wanted to expand on FDR's liberal ideas. He wanted to expand on FDR's uh, social welfare programs. He runs for election in 1948. And what he ends up getting in his idea of expanding and, ex and extending the welfare, social welfare in America, is he ends up with what we call Cold War liberalism. In other words, if you really understand that definition of liberalism, all it means, today we usually refer to it as left or Democrats liberal. What liberalism means is you are very giving in to a particular policy. That's all it means. We usually refer to liberalism referring to social welfare programs in our society today, or liberal to the left, liberal to you know, helping minorities and immigrants and, and people who are in need. Specifically, it simply means you're giving in to certain views and policies. So Cold War liberalism is where we are now giving into policies that directly influence the Cold War, which means they're generally the government leans toward policies that are beneficial to national defense, anti-communism, to democratic propaganda, stuff like this, which means they move away from social welfare programs, leaning more towards smaller government, Fewer taxes and what taxes we get are generally leaning towards military uh, expenditures. And of course, a growth and expansion of the military. In other words, most aspects of government shrink, except for national defense and military, which expands dramatically. So we not only take the money that was going to social welfare programs and divert it into national defense, we also add more money into it, ex further expanding national defense at the extent at the expense of all other needs. Uh, Dewey runs versus Truman in the election. Um, was really close, really close. Uh, there was actually polling really showed Truman was probably going to lose. Uh, polling was not in Truman's uh, benefit. It really looked like Truman was maybe going to win or even lose the election. Well, Truman wins, we believe, primarily for his anti-Soviet rhetoric. Another reason he was so hard on the Soviets. Uh, we, we felt very clearly as a country the Soviets were our enemy. We had already felt this by 1948. Everyone seemed to feel that the communists were the bad guys. And Truman rode the wave of this anti-communist, anti-Soviet uh, feeling in America. And he, he rode that to the wind. Barely. I think he just got like 50% of the vote. It was a really close election. Uh, certainly helped him with the Truman Doctrine and his anti-Soviet rhetoric. Certainly did. Truman wins. He calls his... his <coughs> it's his, technically his first win because he didn't actually win the previous election. He was vice president. 
So it's actually technically his first win as president, and his program is the Fair Deal. Uh, fair to all Americans. He calls for national health care. He calls for aid, uh, educational aid, education money. He calls for housing assistance. He calls for an expansion of Social Security. Increased minimum wage. Minimum wage was instituted under FDR, increased minimum wage. All kinds of new agricultural programs to feed uh, poor people, to feed people in poverty, to feed women and children, widows, uh, things like this, single mothers. Congress was unwilling to support this. The public was unwilling to support this. Uh, any sort of program that would uh, give money to the military or anti-communism, they were all for. Anything else, they were hesitant for. There was not nearly as much public support for all this. Uh, many people were afraid of an enlarged welfare state. They were afraid of, and the, the, the term would often use socialism. The idea of the government providing everything for everyone is this idea of socialism, which for many people is a little bit too close to communism. Socialism and communism are related. And so they're a little bit too close together. Uh, so they lean away from socialism. They lean away from social welfare programs. They believe the money should be used to fight Soviets and, and protect the world for democracy around the world. Uh, also taxes. Lots of social welfare programs, they don't want taxes. But it was really hypocritical because whenever taxes were proposed that the money was going to go to military expenditures, Congress would vote almost unanimously for it. So if it was military, it was taxation for military causes, yeah, everyone's like thumbs up. That's about saving American lives. Um, but causes that were social welfare to save actual Americans starving on the street, uh, Congress voted no on. Hmm. Uh, many called the course his health care program the idea of socialized medicine and you know, socialism. And anyway, um, this was another time, second, third time, the idea of national medicine, national health care was denied again. Uh, going all the way back to uh, Wilson, you know, the idea of national health care has scared so many people on the right, uh, scared so many folks, this idea of national health care socialism. And of course, the expense of it. National health care would really cost a lot of money, it would. But if we balance that with the amount of money we'll save on medical expenses, which are grossly out of, out of whack, um, and the trillions of dollars going to medical companies and medicine companies, pharmaceuticals, well, there you go. Um, also, the improved economy. A lot of people really believed the economy, and it had. The economy had improved dramatically. The war ended the Depression. And after the war ended, we do see a bit of an unemployment spike when the war ends. Not surprising. You've got millions of soldiers that are now unemployed looking for jobs. So because, you know, even though we don't draw down the military completely, still we don't need 15 million soldiers in uniform. So most of those are actually uh, let loose from the military. So we do see an immediate unemployment spike right after the war. But within just a couple of years, that, that really tapers down. And we start seeing really low unemployment higher wages, rich poor gap shrinks. Truth is the economy's better, most people have jobs, most people are working and taking care of their family. So in most people's minds, we don't need all these welfare programs. Truth is most Americans don't need them. But that's the thing, social welfare programs aren't for most Americans. They're for the people who really do need them, the people who really do need the help. Nonetheless, he does achieve a few things. He does get a few reforms. He does get uh, he does get an extension of Social Security. Social Security, which today most most people would argue is maybe the most important welfare program from the U.S. government. And yes, Social Security is a social welfare program. For all of these uh, people who complain about the social welfare program and socialization socialism in America, Social Security is a massive social welfare program, and it is one almost every American will benefit from or use in their lifetimes, with the exception of like the one or two percent. 90, 95% of all Americans will use or access Social Security at some point in their lives. Uh, so, yeah, again, a bit hypocritical. Uh, minimum wage does expand a little bit too, and he does do something which is really quite impressive. He does get the National Housing Act passed. Don't get me wrong. We say he does this, he does this. Congress passes these laws. But the president often pushes Congress to do it. And the president has to want it to happen, otherwise he probably wouldn't sign it because laws passed through Congress require the president to sign it or veto it. So if it happens, it's because the president wants it to happen or believes it needs to happen. 
passes the National Housing Act of 49, which builds 810,000 low-income units. You know, America's got 200 million people. 810,000 may not seem like a lot, but you gotta consider average family is five people. So 810,000 units, that is, that would potentially house over five million, four or five million people. So it is actually quite big. It is a big expenditure of the government. Uh, in essence, paying for in a, in a su subsidized housing for millions of Americans, millions of low, millions of low-income Americans, it is significant. Uh, it is a significant thing he gets passed through. Um, he wanted so much more. Um, he does, you know. We get an expansion of the GI Bill as well. We get the GI Bill coming out of it, but still, Truman wins with 50% of the vote. Very close election against Thomas Dewey, the Republican. Uh, wins by what two two million votes uh four percent it was a close election uh was a close election and now the state's rights strom thurmond here also might have contributed to this it's hard to know but it wouldn't surprise me if the state's rights were probably more in line with the republicans at the time because republicans are about lower taxes democrats are about higher taxes and states' rights are generally about lower taxes. Therefore, the states can use their money how they see fit. They shouldn't have to pay all these taxes to the government. So Strom Thurmond actually probably drew votes away from Thomas Dewey, I would guess. I haven't ever studied this election, but I would guess. If you look at the numbers, though, that might not have made a difference. Even adding Dewey's numbers with sermons, that's still only 47%. So to say Strom Thurmond cost Dewey the election? Probably not. Probably not. Um, again, you have to look at a state by state basis to really be sure to see state by state and look at the actual uh, electoral votes in each state to actually be sure about that. But it's hard to know. If you actually look at Strom Thurmond and look at the southern states here, maybe maybe exactly opposite is the case. Or maybe not. Previously, these southern states always went Democrat. It should be noted in the 40s and 50s is when the southern states start turning Republican. Uh, within another 20 years, the entire South is all Republican, even though in the 1940s, 30s and 40s and 50s, still most Southern states are going Democrat. That's flipping, though. Soon, all of these, which are Democrat states, are all going to be Republican states. So this is really the beginning of that flip. So when you see these pink states here, you might think, well, those would have gone for Truman. Not necessarily. Not necessarily would have gone for Truman possibly some of these might have gone for dewey because this is really where it starts to change in this time period in the southern states where they start to go from where they had been the solid south they start to switch over to solid republican or solid uh, solid south democrat they start to switch to republican and today of course these are solidly republican states so uh, all part of that whole flip between republican and democratic party the republican democratic party uh, from early 1900s to the mid 1900s, pretty much flip entirely ideologies. They're almost 180 degrees different over like a 30, 40 year period. And this is this is part of that. This is we're sort of moving into the tail end of it. Now we're going to talk about the Red Scare. We know today there was a lot of Soviet uh, influence in our government in the 20s and 30s and 40s. However, most of that seemed to have been washed out by the 50s. But many people don't believe that. Many people in the 40s and 50s believe the Soviets are still in our government and spying on us and influencing our government. And this leads us to the Red Scare, the hunt for communists in the United States government and in business, not just government. Because you got to remember what is now closely tied together, military industrial complex, where before private industry and the, the government really were not associated. Now we have multiple private industries and government working almost hand in hand. There's an incredible overlap and crossover between private industry and U.S. government all across the industrial spectrum. And so we have an uh, idea of communists and private industry, communists and government, and anyway, you can see where it scared the hell of a lot of people. Um, we know in the 30s and 40s there were lots of operatives in our government and in private industry. However, we believe most of them were gone by the 40s and 50s, by the late 40s after the war. Most of that really seems to have gone away. We know this because when the Soviet Union falls, they open up their archives. We have access to pretty much all the Soviet records from the 20th century. And we see that they had hundreds of spies in the US. Uh, it's all right there in black and white. So we know this. 
but most of them are, have been withdrawn or pulled out by the 40, late 40s and 50s. Americans don't believe this, though. Most Americans think they're still Soviets all through our government, all through our society. Um, anyway, this is the Red Scare, which is mostly unfounded or really based upon previous decade uh, information and intelligence, because we do now have the intelligence agencies. We do have CIA. So most of it's based on old information and old intelligence. But the thing is with intelligence and, and spy games, as they refer to them, they refer to them as spy games. Um, it sometimes takes years before you actually see the results of an action. Uh, sometimes you can have an agent or an operative in place for a decade or decades before you actually get real actionable intelligence. So the idea that, oh, suddenly there's no one here, uh, well, for all we know, there could be sleepers, there could be spies, there could be secret. I mean, again, that's what you're supposed to do as a spy, right? You're not supposed to get caught. If you get caught, <laughs> you're not doing a very good job. So you're supposed to not get caught. So many people still believe they're spies all through our government. Um, so Truman believes this, and he believes he has to protect himself against Soviets. Truman was incredibly paranoid against the Soviets. He really was. He believes he has to protect himself and protect our government. He issues Executive Order 9835, which authorizes businesses and government to investigate their employees for subversion. Subversion, that's the word they would use because you've been subverted by the Soviets. Basically, you've been turned into a Soviet agent. Um, these, aren't, these aren't the idea of Soviet people infiltrating our government, although that did happen occasionally. This is the idea of Americans which have turned. Basically, these are Americans which have, are, are, have turned to the Soviet cause. And they're Americans born here, but they're now working secretly for the Soviets or communists. So we now authorize our government, we authorize private business to start investigating all of our employees and all of our citizens for subversion. Uh, we create the loyalty security program out of executive order 9835. It's a, it's a program, a new sort of a department in the government, a new, uh, a new agency to, in essence, determine the loyalty of Americans and to ensure the security of America. Yeah, really paranoid shit. You better believe it was paranoid stuff, and we 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 bought into it one hundred percent. We did uh, as as a people, as a population. It allowed them to investigate anybody for subversion. Um, and the problem was a very loose interpretation of this was you could investigate anyone who had any any type of ideas that didn't mesh with the the idea the mainstream ideals. So if you were gay, uh, again homosexual, if you were a minority. Um, if you were, uh, uh, your political leanings, if you weren't, you know, very straight line Republican or Democrat, if, and we had lots of political parties, we had a communist parties, we had independent parties, you know, we had peace, freedom party, we had all kinds of stuff. So if you weren't in any way perfectly aligned with the standard, the norm in America, whether it has to do with race, sexuality, uh, political leanings. Uh, whatever. They could simply attack you, accuse you of committing a crime, and that's all it required. Literally, this time period, all it required is someone pointing your finger at you and accusing you of subversion. No evidence. Literally, one person's word against yours, you were done. The employers would fire you. They would, you know, they'd chase you out of your neighborhood. They'd chase your kids out of the school. Your life could be ruined. All because one person accused you of being a Soviet uh, subver a subversive, someone who uh, who was who was sympathetic to the Soviets. Your life was over. Your entire family's life will be destroyed. Uh, that's how crazy it was. That's how that's how paranoid we were. P thousands lost their jobs. Thousands of people lost their homes. They were kicked out of neighborhoods, communities. Um, uh, people were killed. People were killed on the street, beaten to death. People were lynched. Um, for these kinds of things. Another aspect of this is loyalty oaths. Most governments, uh, most government employees, and even a lot of private companies now require you to raise your hand and take an oath of allegiance to the Constitution or to the government uh, to swear your loyalty. In other words, to ensure 100% American. Boy, we're coming back to that again. 1920s, anybody? 100% Americans? Uh, World War One. <laughs> Yeah, it's a recurring theme. I don't know that we've actually still gotten away from it. Because, by the way, loyalty oaths are still standard today. Me, as a community college professor, I had to take a loyalty oath. 
to uphold the Constitution of the state of California. Uh, when I was in the military, when I was in the army, I had to take a oath to, uh, pr pr to uphold the Constitution of the United States government. So we still do this today. I don't know what it proved, because if you were a spy or a subversive, wouldn't you be the first person in line? Like, oh, I'm going to take the oath. I mean, your entire your entire ideology is based on lying and deception. So wouldn't you immediately want to take the oath? We do know this was used to have extended prosecutions on someone. Today we have a term that we call a hate crime. Basically, they can add on if you commit a crime. They can add on extra sentence. They can add on extra punishment for a hate crime. Well, this is sort of that kind of thing. Uh, if you commit a crime or you found that you've done something that might be subversive, if you've also sworn an oath, they can tack on extra charges, including potentially uh, purposeful treason. Because you didn't do it accidentally. You didn't do it because you were coerced. You purposefully chose to lie to the government which means they might be able to tack on treason and even execution. We're not committing a capital crime. We're giving away government secrets or giving away information, which is not something you'd normally be executed for. Uh, we typically only execute for capital crimes. Well, by doing loyalty oath, they sort of make treason or subversion into a quasi-capital crime. And there are a handful of people executed for this stuff. Only a few. This, this gets crazy out of hand and thousands of people get arrested, lots of people go to jail and tens of thousands of lives are ruined. Uh, but as far as actual number of people who are executed by this or, or spend long prison terms, very few do that. Uh, but it still doesn't keep it from destroying many lives. HUAC has also created the House Un-American Activities Committee. This is in the House of Congress, uh, the, uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, it was led by Martin Dees of Texas. He was a Texas congressman. Um, and specifically, specifically, yes, specifically, it was holding public hearings uh, on the possible infiltration of communism in American industries, uh, where communists were subverting American industries. And the reason for this was the military industrial complex, because so many industries work closely with the government. If there's subversives in industry, those subversives are going to influence and leak into the federal government. So he has to investigate all of this. Um, uh, many people were accused of this. Uh, you were blacklisted. Uh, this is, again, you lost your job. You lose your career, uh, everything. You, you lose everything if you were blacklisted. Um, you could ruin your life. Uh, one of the, Martin Dees went like directly after the movie industry for one. He went after the Hollywood industry. Uh, there was a famous group known as the Hollywood 10, I believe, where like big, Film producers, directors were bought before the House committee, and many of them were accused of being communist sympathizers. And uh, uh, we do believe this was actually tied in anti-Semitism, because most of those people called before HUAC were Jewish, and they were accused of being communist sympathizers. The reason behind this is not always clear. It may simply be the tradition and the longstanding history of anti-Semitism in America. Um, it may also be that Eastern Europe, which is now under the influence of the Soviets, is where most Jewish people lived. So most of your Jewish people were living in Eastern Europe, and they're now nominally Soviet. Um, they don't they don't consider themselves Soviets, but they're under the Soviet sphere. And so the idea that we have we have millions of Jewish people, and and some of them do escape, and some of them do come to America uh, during the 40s and 50s, uh, before Europe is in a total lockdown behind the Iron Curtain. So you get, you know, uh, some of that bleeds into that they, they came from Europe, so they might be working for the Soviets. And, and then you just have the traditional history of anti-Semitism. Well, with the opening of the archives in the 1990s when the Soviet Union fell, December 25th, 1991, we do realize two things. One, the Soviet infiltration of America wasn't nearly as great as we, we thought it was. Uh, it wasn't, I mean, the idea you get from Dees and Huac and McCarthyism, which we'll talk about next, was that Soviet infiltration was through all aspects. And you know, like there were thousands of Soviets infiltrating our government and thousands of subversives and our whole, uh, our whole way of life was under attack. That is the impression you get from media, uh, mil movies, um, the government. Not true. However, the second part of that is it was real. There was Soviet infiltration. We do know there was. Uh, we do know that the uh, we do know there was a, there was a communist party in America. We know they were directly taking money from the Soviets. There was a handful of people in Hollywood that do appear to have been 
sympathizers with the Soviets. It was a few. Um, we do know that there were people in America pushing a Soviet agenda. You got to consider before all this happened, we the Soviet Union was our ally. So there were hundreds of thousands of people in the U.S. that were uh, Soviet or socialist or communist sympathizers or part of the Communist Party. Uh, socialism was a big movement, especially among poor. Uh, we see quite a few, especially minorities, because communism uh, at, its, at its inherent, I mean, on paper, communism isn't really that bad. On paper, communism is about equality and everybody gets a fair share and there's, there's, no, there's no poverty. Everyone is taken care of on paper. In reality, so uh, communism never works out like that, and it almost always becomes an oppressive, totalitarian uh, uh, power at the top. Everyone else suffers. So in action, communism is bad. So there were lots of people who were sort of sympathetic to it. We do know that the Soviets, uh, and there were people in America who uh, uh, money went to influence unions, for instance, at some big industries, other organizations pushing the agenda. So there is some justification for this Red Scare, but I take it from a, like a level of 10 to a level of two. That's what we're looking at. We're taking it where 10 is how they're treating it as though it's, it's literally gonna collapse American civilization, Western civilization. So the, the reality was there's a handful of people here and there which are sort of pushing a Soviet agenda, literally like a 1%, one tenth of a percent, one hundredth of a percent. Anyway, uh, so it was real, but it was it was it was it was the how how does it go make a mountain out of a molehill? It was it existed, but not to that degree. Well, let me get to McCarthy, which is is really the epitome of how how this became um, a, a global pardon me a national paranoia. Um, McCarthy in 1950 claimed to have a list of 250 known communists working in the State Department. Yeah, he claimed to have a list of 250 communists working in the State Department. State Department is our foreign relations department. They're the ones that generally deal with other countries. He claims to have all these people that are on this list that are communist, either communist, communist sympathizers. He then spends four years, uh, a four year smear campaign where he, in essence, attacks anyone who is soft on communism, anyone who is part of the Democratic Party, uh, anyone who tries to counter him, anyone who tries to challenge him. Anyone who tries to in any way resist his idea that communism is going to um, infiltrate and take over our country and bring down Western democracy. Uh, he is he's he's crazy about this. It is it is all consuming for him. The idea that the communists, we have to stop communism at all costs and Soviets at all costs and literally every single American who has any tendencies towards socialist ideas has to be rooted out and identified and destroyed. To this end, he makes up this list. Yes, he makes it up. There's no names. There's nothing. Uh, eventually, we get TV hearings. Uh, this is the TV era. TV's invented in 47. By the early 50s, millions of people have TVs. So we get TV hearings. We get attacks on Democrats. We get attacks on um, uh, all these other people, anyone who challenges uh, his his say, so anyone who ever questions our attacks on communism or containment or the Cold War. Uh, Republicans seem to be okay with this. Very few Republicans have ever attacked. Uh, generally, the Republicans supported McCarthy in every way. Even Eisenhower supported McCarthy uh, for a while. General, and he, Eisenhower gets elected president in 52 as a Republican. So generally speaking, as long as the attacks were going against the Democrats or liberals, the Republicans were okay with it. Then in 1954, in a televised hearing, McCarthy starts attacking a handful of generals, like, like three and four star generals, our, our most heroic people, many of them heroes of World War II and the Korean War. And he starts attacking them publicly on television and saying, you know, some of you are communist spies, some of you are sympathizers. And the generals won't take it. They're like, forget it. You're not going to get away with this. You need to give us proof. You need to make you need to actually give proof. And the Department of Defense gets in on it and says, you know, if you're going to start accusing generals of being communist sympathizers, you need to show proof. And it comes out. He has no proof. There is no list. He made the whole thing up. Every bit of it. Uh, all in his all of in his agenda to try and push anti-communism, anti-Soviet uh, beliefs. 
His popularity falls immediately. He is exposed as a huckster, a liar, a cheat. Uh, it's revealed he's no list. He's been fooling America for years and really uh, stoking the fears and hatred in America. And yeah, um, he is eventually, he's censured by Congress. He doesn't get reelected. He uh, becomes an alcoholic. And in just a couple years, he dies of alcohol poisoning. A ruined man. Is really sort of the, the story of the Red Scare of the 1950s, how, how, what it really resulted in. Ultimately, it resulted in, in destruction and dismay and ruining thousands of lives, and it accomplished nothing. It really didn't. Um, it really did nothing. But it directed us away from maybe more important matters of social issues and race issues, which the Republicans were all well happy with that. Um, the Democratic Party, as we'll talk about in the next in Chapter 27, were the ones that were really pushing more of a a, a civil rights agenda, and we see a lot of pushback from Eisenhower and from the Republican Congress. So it, it deflected from more important issues of social issues and focused everybody upon this issue of the Soviet infiltration, which did wasn't really wasn't a reality, or it was a very small reality. So look at these pictures. You'll probably need to flick through them several times in case there's a discussion question. Uh, so, you know, it's recorded. You can go back and forth. So I'll stay in each one for a moment. Uh, you have invaders from Mars here. What you need to be looking at in each of these photos is simple. You need to be looking of, you need to be looking for Cold War themes. You need to be looking for anti-Soviet themes. You need to be looking for themes that fit in with the Red Scare, McCarthyism, because all these posters are from the 50s. These are all Hollywood movie posters from the 50s. So we're looking at colors, themes, issues of women, issues of war, violence, issues of subversion and trickery and deception. Uh, also, bear in mind this, which I haven't talked about yet, this is the beginning of the space age. The Soviets in the 40s and 50s are putting things up in space. They're putting satellites up. They're putting dogs. They're putting men in space. Um, pretty sure they left that dog up there. That's terrible. Um, so they're doing all this kind of stuff, and uh, so the space age is a new thing. People don't know what to think of it. The idea of traveling through space and going to other planets or going to the moon, which is all something that's becoming reality over the next few years. Uh, and of course, who is our main competitor in the space race? It's U.S. versus Soviet Union. Um, so you need to the same thing. Instead of spending money on social programs, they spent all their money trying to get first in space. And they were. They put the first people in space, first man in space, first ship in space. They put the first satellite in space. They beat us on every front in that category on all those things they just said. Uh, and so we are worried about space, worried about invasion, we're worried about uh, an attack by the Chinese, an attack by the Soviets. Uh, we're worried about subversion, body snatching, subversion. They all look like they're Americans. Mm -hmm. um, pod people. Um, I married a monster from outer space. Look at the colors. And what was the Soviet color? Soviet color was red. So look at the colors. Look at look at the ideas of women in this. Look how women are portrayed. Women are portrayed in everyone as a particular way. Here we go. I mean, how much more direct can you get? I married a communist. Her beauty served a mob of terror whose one mission is to destroy. I mean, there you go. Um, also think how some of this might have been a response to HUAC. HUAC went after Hollywood for being Soviet sympathizers. Well, all of these posters come about after that. So how is this a response from Hollywood to HUAC and the Red Scare? Because most of these are in like 55, 56, 57. If you look closely, if you're able to like zoom in, you'll actually see the dates on some of the posters. I think they're all like 58. So they're all from the mid 50s after the Red Scare sort of died down. Yet the, it isn't like we, we are suddenly, we still hate communists. So the Red Scare, the, the, the atmosphere is still all through America. So think about all those things, colors and women, all the different ideas of invasion and space and women and communism and the Hollywood industry after HUAC. And uh, think about all that stuff uh, when you look at these posters and make sure you can answer a good discussion or an essay question about these. Uh, it's really interesting and it's hugely significant. It tells you so much about 1950s culture. That this is what, in 1950s, most movies were focused on uh, teenagers, war, 
and things like this, things about monsters and aliens and space and the unknown and mysteries. Yeah. Really interesting era to live through is the 1950s, let me tell you. Uh, you know, for most of you, it would be your grandparents or your even maybe even your great grandparents uh, lived through this era. So it's interesting. All right. So let's talk about uh, the America under Cold War liberalism, Ike. I like Ike. That was how it would go. And Ike was actually a good president. Um, uh, he was a, a good president for I uh, served eight years. Uh, during this entire 30 year period from the 30s to the 60s is our only Republican president. All the others are Democrat. So uh, he's in a he's in an era of Cold War liberalism where the 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 general feel in America is towards a little more liberal policies, a little more government uh, involvement. So he's forced to be more of a moderate president. He can't be a real hardline Republican president, really hardline conservative. Uh, he's sort of a middle of the road Republican. He doesn't do anything to really change the status quo. And after he leaves office, you know, that we get a couple more Democratic presidents. Um, Nikita Khrushchev takes over the Soviet Union in 56. Stalin was there at the end of the war. Stalin dies in 53. Uh, Soviet Union goes through a three year civil war. It's ugly. It's brutal. It's messy. So they go through a three year civil war. Finally, in 56, one man rises to power and eventually takes over the Soviet party and takes, which it's a one party system. So when you take over the Soviet party, you, you in essence have taken over the Soviet Union. Takes over the Soviet Union. He calls for peaceful coexistence between America and Russia. He calls, he calls for what? He calls for peaceful coexistence between the Soviet Union and America. What? Yeah. Um, he denounces Stalin as violent, cruel, murderer. I didn't say it before, but the two greatest murderers in world history are considered to be Stalin and Mao. Between Stalin and Mao, they murdered or caused the deaths of probably between 80 to 100 million people. This number varies widely because the Soviets and the Chinese have been very sort of uh, try to control the records of all this stuff. But due to a, a variety of social and agricultural programs, they killed tens of millions of their own people, murdered, executed, starved to death. Together, the two of them in the 40s and 50s are probably responsible for killing 50, 80 or a million or more people of their own people, their own people, not others, their own people. Uh, far worse than anything that happened in any other war, or any other catastrophe, and they were killing their own. So Stalin was a bad dude. Like ranking up there in all time history is one of the baddest dudes ever. He was really terrible. Well, Mao as well. So we get a new policy where Khrushchev says Stalin was bad and I'm going to try to fix everything and make it better. He, he seems to openly seems to have a very open policy towards the West. Yeah, he seems like that. Ike has a new policy. Ike has what's called the new, the new look policy. Uh, Ike's new look policy. Here's Ike's new look policy. He decreases military buildup on weapons and people and supplies while increasing the building of nuclear bombs. He believes nuclear bombs will be a deterrent. He starts building up massive numbers of H-bombs and we get the biggest uh, nuclear stockpile that we see built until like the 1980s uh, under Reagan. This huge nuclear stockpile. Reagan is really ironic. Reagan builds up a huge nuclear stockpile and then he starts to tear it down. But nonetheless, we see this big buildup of these weapons in this time period. He believed the bombs would be sufficient to deter attack. Uh, Eisenhower is very reluctant to criticize McCarthy. He did very little to actually criticize the whole Red Scare. Uh, speak out on civil rights. He didn't really do much to speak out on civil rights at all either. Um, he believes MAD will be the answer. Mutually assured destruction. He makes it very public that we are building up our nuclear stockpile. He makes sure the, the through intelligence uh, connections, he makes sure the Soviets know this, that we're building up more bombs. This is a period of time we start building military bunkers all across the central United States to start housing nuclear weapons. Um, we start really a arms reduction, a people reduction, but a massive buildup of the big bombs so that we can specifically scare the Soviets into leaving us alone. So while Khrushchev causes for a lessening of tensions, 
Eisenhower also apparently has a lessening of tensions, while behind the scenes, he makes it known to the particular people who needed that we got bigger, better bombs. We don't need as many tanks, planes, and soldiers, because if you screw with us, we're simply going to wipe out your cities one at a time. So anyway, uh, again, he doesn't really speak out on civil rights. He's very moderate. He's very appealing. Uh, he had no taste for Washington. He wasn't a, he wasn't a politician. This was his first politics. And he was a war hero. He was a war hero from World War II. He wasn't a politician. He was a general. And as a result, he was pretty much no bullshit, no nonsense. Uh, he wasn't particularly, it doesn't seem like he was particularly racist or anything. He just, uh, he believed in se desegregation in the military. He was a supporter of that. So he seemed like it was a generally a fair, moderate guy who had more, more conservative leaning ideas, a fair Republican uh, president. Uh, Democrat policies were still pretty dominant in America in the time. Um, we also find something very interesting in this time period. We do see very bi bipartisan Washington. We really do see where most Democrats and Republicans agree on the big stuff. Big stuff, Cold War. Everyone should support the Cold War, no matter which side of the aisle you're on. Everyone should support national defense. The degree to which you support it is debatable. You know, whether you want how much money you want, but everyone agrees we must defend ourselves against the communist. We must support containment. They all agree the Soviets are enemies. Again, the degree to which you want to uh, villainize and demonize the Soviets is argued. But generally speaking, everyone agrees the Soviets are our biggest enemy in the world, our biggest problem. And, and the economy. Generally, people agree the economy is a major concern. Nowhere in here are social welfare issues. Truth be told, the Democrats lean away from this, too. Uh, we're doing great. 1950s is a boom for America. Most people have jobs. Most people can have two jobs if they want to. Unemployment's really low. People are buying homes. The economy's great. Yeah, industry is booming. Uh, bo booms in education and booms in new technologies. It's really a great period in America, uh, generally speaking. Generally speaking. Especially if you're white. Everyone benefits, no matter what color you are or gender you are. This booming economy and our our recovery from the depression it benefits everybody. Who's the benefit mostly? Well, it benefits big business and industry the most, as it always does. And then it benefits, of course, the whites. But even minority people are benefit from this. We see reduction in desegregation, we or segregation. We see reductions in discrimination, except for like the very deep South. We see uh, increasing rights for women. We see women getting more active in politics. The number of female politicians in Washington doubles in this time period. So it's still a small number compared to men, but it's still an increase, a significant increase. So we do start seeing some fracturing of the old uh, way it was in early America to where it was literally a country that was just really for white men. It still is a country where white men get the greatest benefit. But it is a country where there is a lot more benefit to all Americans to some degree. So we do see this. Uh, it, it, I, Eisenhower does seem like the right guy. He did seem like a good middle of the road guy. And we do seem a middle of the road country to where most people agree on the most important issues. At least what they think is most important issues at the time. Well, let's talk about the rest of the world. What about outside of America? What was Eisenhower's biggest concern? Uh, top of this list for Eisenhower was uh, USSR, defense, and the Cold War. All those together, Soviets, really. De defeating the Soviets and, and resisting the Soviets and challenging the Soviets. Uh, and we were really concerned about the stability of foreign governments. The reasoning behind this is very straightforward. If foreign governments aren't stable, then it makes it easier for a small minority to gain appeal and to break into political power. And then they would get assistance from China or the Soviets, and then they might actually take over. This happens. I mean, look what happened in Korea. This happens in Cuba. Cuba gets taken over by the Soviets. Iran, uh, the, it doesn't get taken over by the Soviets, but it gets taken over by very authoritarian, uh, uh, government, a very, uh, in case of Iran, it's sort of a, a quasi-religious state. So we get, we get people who take over who are often authoritarian, 
not communist, but just as bad. Uh, South Korea today is is a is a demo, is basically a social democracy. But initially, after the war, South Korea gets taken over by a totalitarian warlord, really, that we sort of helped put into power. And this isn't even mentioning Vietnam, which I'm, I'm going to cover here in just a second. And Vietnam is even worse. So we stop communist takeover of some of these places, but the person who takes charge is really just as bad, but not communist. Uh, communism in Iran, Cuba, South Korea, they all end up being controlled by very authoritarian governments, but not communist. NATO was created, I mentioned before, CETO was created. CETO is the Southeast Atlantic Treaty Organization. So we have the North Atlantic, which is NATO, and then we have Southeast Atlantic, uh, or Treaty Organization, which, in, which involves some South American countries, some African countries, all again to resist communism infiltration, communist aggression. Uh, CIA is created in 1947, I believe, Central Intelligence Agency, specifically to do the counterintelligence, uh, the behind-the-scenes espionage against Soviet uh, spies. Soviets had their own spy agency. I'm sure you've heard of it, the KGB. Um, they were their own spy, and they were better at it than we were. It was, it's pretty obvious. You, you, this, the KGB was better at this than we were because we had morals. We had ethics. We had some rules we lived by that we were supposed to obey some types of morality and our, our and the KGB did not. KGB had no, they, did, they would break any rules, they would, they would do anything to further the interests of their country. And most CIA agents had a, at least a moralistic view that they had to do this. So we were, we were constrained in some ways, and I'm sure it varied by agent, but generally we, we saw ourselves as more constrained and unwilling to do really heinous things like assassinations and stuff, even though it did happen. We do know the CIA did occasionally do this due to the freedom of information. A lot of those records have become open to us now. But the KGB did this stuff all the time. KGB had no problem assassinating, killing people, and murdering people, and poisoning people, and doing stuff, wiping out entire families, entire governments. I mean, they, uh, the things we did were sometimes reprehensible, but by comparison to the KGB, they were far worse, uh, which made them more successful. Uh, due to their fact that they didn't, they were willing to do almost anything to further the Soviet agenda. Uh, we did secret operations. We did coups. Uh, 1945 is is, uh, is is an example of what happens in Vietnam. So uh, this is another country which is trying to uh, Ho Chi Minh. I don't know if they have his name. I don't have his name on here. Ho Chi Minh is in North Vietnam, trying to lead a communist movement to take over all of Vietnam. The U.S. fears another communist country, and we get into another we get into another version of of um, of Korea here. Now, forty five. That's before Korea. That's because that's when it starts. We are involved in Korea. And, or pardon me. We are involved in Vietnam and what happens in Vietnam for thirty years. We literally get involved in forty five, and we don't actually extricate ourselves from Vietnam until about nineteen seventy five. So for thirty years, we are intricately tied up in Vietnam's politics and war. 1945, it was French. This was part of French Indochina. So the French uh, had this before the war. They claimed it after the war. It was one of their mandates. Remember, we talked about mandates. So the French mandated this. This is in uh, Indochina, so southeast of China, around Cambodia, Laos. Uh, they asked for Viet Vietnamese to help them in the war and promise them independence. The war ends, and France says, no, we're not going to give you independence. We're going to keep you as a colony or as a mandate. And the Vietnamese rise up, and the person who leads this rise to kick the China, kick the French out is actually communist, this Ho Chi Minh. So he gets the support of many Vietnamese people by his anti-French. But the thing is, a lot of his actual military support comes from communism, and weapons and money comes from that. Now Ho Chi Minh hated the Chinese, but he took their money and supplies and weapons, even though he hated the Chinese communists. So we get involved in a war, uh, nominally in a war in Vietnam in the 40s, assisting the French because the French are our allies. So we're helping the French, and we're really oppressing the Vietnamese by helping the French. That goes on for a few years. Finally, the French are defeated in 1954, and we get uh, a, um, we give money and advisors. We don't give like full-on military action. Think like um, think like the Special Forces Green Beret. We send in advisors to advise and help train, to help train and uh, educate the Vietnamese in the South 
to fight the communists in the north. So we're helping one part of Vietnam fight the other part of Vietnam, uh, even though we're we're also sort of helping the French as well. All of this goes for several years. Finally, it ends up around 1954 with a peace treaty. Then two years later, the Geneva Accords are passed. In 1956, Geneva Accords are passed. The French are defeated. The French finally walk away. Um, they give up, uh, realizing that they simply can't win this guerrilla war against them. And we have now sort of leaned towards the Vietnamese. We initially got involved in the 40s to help the French against this upstart communist. But by the 1950s, we're actually leaning towards Vietnamese independence. We're pulling away from the French and really we're, we're pushing the French to walk away and leave Vietnam alone. Uh, we're going to stop the communists and we're going to give Vietnam independence, which is sort of what we, we, what we sort of claim is we're there to perform or foster democracy and you know, leave them alone. So we, we finally, through a whole treaty negotiation, the French walk away, the Jeeva Accords are passed, and it partitions Vietnam into two parts. We get North Vietnam and South Vietnam. The U.S. is still there. We're still involved. We're there through the whole thing, uh, even though it was really between the Vietnamese, the communists, and France, we were in the middle of it all. Again, policemen of the world. We thought we were going to, again, this involved communism, so we had to be involved. Uh, the U.S. rejects it. And we say we don't want this North and South Vietnam. We want an entirely free Vietnam. We actually take over uh, South Vietnam effectively. We don't officially do it, but we effectively take it over. We rig the entire election and we get Diem elected as president. We make this happen. And Diem agrees to be our puppet. He agrees to assist us and help us and to uh, basically push American policies in the region. So we put a pro-U.S. government, Vietnam, Vietnam. Uh, reunification doesn't occur. Vietnam, DM doesn't get that. Uh, we don't get North and South Vietnam brought back together. Um, we end up giving hundreds of million dollars every year, hundreds of millions every year to DM to assist and support and to prop up uh, his government, specifically because he is not communist, even though he is a authoritarian um, dictator a murderer, a mass murderer. He's a bad guy, but he's not communist. And so we give him hundreds of millions of dollars of support and, and troops and supplies, etc., cetera, um, all, to, uh, all to help him stay in power because he promises to push our agenda and to resist the communists, which he does mostly. He does mostly. I'll move this up here now. Well, we're going to continue Vietnam in a later chapter. We'll talk about how it all pans out. Again, this only goes to the 50s. We will continue the Vietnam story in chapter, oh no, what is it, chapter 28? If we get that far. If we, you know, if we end up getting in chapter 28, we'll continue the Vietnam story. Uh, spoiler alert, here it comes. Give you time to fast forward if you need to. Uh, we eventually go in and assassinate Viet Diem. We go kill him, like in 63. Because he's so bad, we put him into power, and then 63, I think we go and assassinate him. It's one of the few. Uh, uh, it's one of the very. It's one of the few revealed um, assassinations. You know, at, much after the fact. It's not like they admitted to it at the time, but it's one of the things that CIA doesn't deny because it's in the records that we assassinate him. Um, because he was so bad, it, it was so terrible. Buddhist monks were self-immolating themselves in Vietnam. That means where you pour oil over yourself and set yourself on fire on purpose. All to bring national attention to, to Diem and how, how murderous Diem was. Murder, Diem was killing thousands of his own people. He was terrible. Um, people were committing suicide just to bring national attention to it. Buddhist monks were. That's unbelievable. So last thing we'll really get here. Oh, I guess the last thing is we'll talk about Kennedy. So the last thing before we get to the last thing. How's that work out for you? Is the Middle East. And I'm going to briefly talk about Middle East and Israel. Well, uh, we have a different problem, which have been brewing for years. Ever since the teens, we had this problem in the Middle East dealing with this uh, Jewish homeland. Uh, Palestine, uh, which the Jews claim is their homeland, uh, which it was their traditional homeland, uh, was populated mostly by Muslim Arabs, Palestinians. Uh, this was the Jewish homeland, claimed to be Jewish homeland. Uh, the British had, um, uh, had this as a mandate after World War I. But then right before the British decide to abandon it and leave it alone, they partition it into two parts. 
They, they actually split Palestine between the Arabs and the Jews and giving half of Palestine, half of the country to the Jewish people, half of the country to the Palestinians, in which the Palestinians didn't agree to any of this. Uh, Palestinians have been living there for 15 centuries. So for better part of 1500 years, it had been Arab lands. And then of course, previous to that, thousands of years ago, it had been Jewish lands. And so the Jews claimed it was their land, but I think the Palestinians had a very fair claim as well. They had been living there for over a thousand years and they claimed it was their land. Nonetheless, England gets involved and the U.S. gets involved. We partition it. We cut it in half. We give half of it to the Jewish people, half of it to the Palestinians, pushing hundreds of thousands of Palestinians out of their homes and lands and farms and give it to Jewish people who start migrating there from all around the world. This idea of this Jewish homeland. Uh, we have a term for this called Zionism, the idea of a Jewish homeland and the desire for this Jewish homeland. And we get the creation of Israel this new Jewish state, which is officially recognized by both England and America, and that makes it official. Once England and America recognize it as a new country, it now becomes an official state, and then many other countries recognize it as well. Uh, the Palestinians don't. Many other Arab nations don't, because they feel this is an atrocity. Uh, I mean, how would we think in America if some other country invaded our country, um, and just took out like half of like took out like several of our states and just said, okay, they're not your country anymore. They're someone else's country. So it's it's understandable why many uh, Arabs and many uh, Palestinians were well willing to kill over this. Uh, we would in America if someone did this to us, we would be willing. It would be an act of war. Well, they go to war. Um, the we get a league of multiple Arab countries. I think about seven countries actually form a confederation, an alliance known as the Arab League. They get military weapons and supplies and tanks and planes, and they invade Israel. Uh, this invasion occurs, I don't have the exact dates in my notes, but I think this invasion occurs in the early 50s. Um, don't quote me on the date, but somewhere in this time period we're looking at, we have this Arab League invasion. I don't know why I didn't put my notes, I should have. Um, uh, the Jews fight back and they win. They win though with our assistance. They're using military supplies and weapons and money from the United States and England and France and other countries, uh, in essence, come to the Isra Israelis' uh, defense. Uh, had we not assisted them, they certainly would have been defeated. The Arab League was, was pretty big and there were seven countries involved. They would have, I mean, this was a brand new fledgling country. And so we felt our need to protect and help, plus our, our, our a lot of this also ties into the Holocaust. Many people in the West thought we owed the Jews this for what happened to them under, under Hitler, where Hitler had massacred millions of Jewish people. Many millions of innocent Jews were killed. And that, that's just the ones that were killed. That doesn't include all of the other oppression, violence, discrimination, racism, all their lost lands and jobs and homes and lives destroyed. I mean, Jews had been persecuted forever. So lots of death and destruction had been brought upon Jewish people. So this was thought as a, sort of a reward, uh, a payback. Plus Jewish people had helped support the war with money. And further, uh, there were a lot of people in power in the United States. There were actually a few people in politicians and there were people in authority in certain places in the US that were pro-Jewish, of course. But there's also a darker side to this. Anti-Semitism was common in England and America. We know now today through, uh, there, there's a lot of evidence that a lot of the government's purpose in doing this and creating Israel was to actually get Jewish people out of Christian America and to get Jewish people out of Christian England, out of Anglican England. They wanted a lot. It was anti-Semitism. So there was a distinct push by many government officials that was anti-Jewish. And the best way to deal with that was to simply give them a place to go, to kick them out of the country or to, to entice them to move somewhere else um, by giving them their own state. So. We see that occur. Uh, ultimately, millions of Jewish people do eventually go to Israel, of course, it becomes you know, the, the, the Jewish country. Uh, uh, Palestinians are mostly forced into refugee camps. Thousands died, starvation, disease, malnutrition. Um, it was terrible. President Truman does recognize Israel as a nation. It does, of course, help him get reelected in 1948. Better believe that was an influence that's not unusual, though. Any politician, as any politician will not ever tell you, but it is the truth. The most important thing to any politician is to get reelected. And they'll say the reasoning behind this is simple. 
how can I help or do my work for America if I'm not elected? I have to be elected first, then I can help people. Anyway, he wanted to be reelected in 1948, and he wanted Jewish assistance and Jewish votes and Jewish money. Uh, so we also know this was influential in Truman's recognition, almost immediate recognition of Israel after uh, England uh, partitions uh, Palestine and leaves. Uh, almost immediately recognized that. And of course, our military assistance during the Arab invasion was certainly uh, predicated as well on this, this idea of getting Jewish votes and Jewish assistance, and of course, rewarding Jews and giving Jews they've been asking for a homeland. This is such a multifaceted topic. There's so many aspects to this and so many different sides to this. Uh, there is nothing simple about this. It is one of the most complicated issues in world history, uh, and it is still something we are dealing with today, of course. Further, he issues the, uh, uh, it alienates the Arab world, of course. It makes enemies of many Arab countries. Uh, there's places in the Arab world which still have not forgiven us today for this, for what we've done and what continues to happen to Palestinians in the world today. Um, uh, Palestinians are a group that is is largely, largely being injured on a regular basis. Um, and of course, Jews would argue counter to that, that they're being injured on a regular basis as well by Palestinians. Yeah, so anyway. Anyway, uh, lots of further issues. Uh, 1957, Eisen, lots of other stuff. Again, we could go on for hours about this. Eisenhower issues the Doctrine in 1957, which says pretty much exactly the same thing as the Truman Doctrine. Only instead of focusing on Europe, it focuses on the Middle East. We will come to your aid. We'll assist any Arab country in the Middle East, anyone who needs help or assistance to resist uh, communist aggression. It's really just the Truman Doctrine only focused on the Middle East. This was also a way that he was, he was trying to befriend some Middle Eastern countries by saying, hey, just ask us for help and we'll help you. We'll give you money, we'll give you troops, we'll give you supplies, as long as you help us too. Uh, recognize Israel, accept Israel, uh, give us trade, oil, stuff like that. And we do end up befriending several Middle Eastern countries. Uh, was it Saudi Arabia becomes an ally of ours? Is it Yemen that becomes an ally of ours? Jordan, maybe? Um, Turkey? Uh, I'm pretty sure on several of those, they become allies of the United States. And many reasons, because we become business partners. And of course, they start, you know, we become like their number one oil customer. Plus, we do give, we do mil the mil we have military bases like Turkey, we build them all over the country. Uh, so we do give them assistance, we give them money and they help us as well. And so the Eisenhower Doctrine is effective. Um, it still doesn't in any way address or solve the issue of Palestinian-Israeli relations, not in the slightest, but it makes some people in the Middle East friendlier to the US, but it also makes some people in the Middle East hate us even more. This gives you an idea of uh, some of these treaties, NATO, CENTO, South Korea, Mutual Defense, Philippines, ANZA, CETO, the re, uh, you know, it's all these different stuff. Some of these don't exist anymore. Some of these like CETO is went disbanded in 77. Uh, CENTO is disbanded in 79. But you should also notice most countries in the world are made neutral. Uh, NATO ends up getting like 30 some countries. Warsaw Pact is only a small, now these, that, that, let me take that back. All of these are pretty much resisting uh, outside aggression. None of these are pro-Soviet. These are all pretty much anti-Soviet, anti-totalitarian, anti-authoritarian. None of these are like pro-Soviet treaties. Anyway, some exist still today. NATO, of course, although NATO has certainly been weakened in the last few years, but they're still out there. Um, Cold War is what it was. I don't think I ever really defined Cold War, did I? I, I gave you all the like, definitions of it, but it actually means, like, what's Cold War mean? What never happened in this time period? What never happened once the Cold War began? No bombs, no nukes. Lots of fighting, lots of killing, lots of small bombs, but was there another World War? No. Was there another nuclear drop? No. Still, we're the only country that's ever dropped two bombs on a populated center, just us. So there were no more atomic or nuclear dro bomb drops. There was no more global war. However, the world was full of, um, oh my God, it's totally blank, uh, proxy wars. The world was full of proxy wars. This is where wars are fought um, that really take the place of the big war. Vietnam and Korea, proxy wars. 
Who supported one side of Vietnam? The communists, China, Russia. Who supported the other side? The United States, the West. Same thing in Vietnam, Korea, lots of other countries. These were proxy wars. These are wars that are not officially fought between the big countries because that would lead to potentially, literally, global devastation. We're talking about global devastation on a, on a level that would be you know, unimaginable. Nuclear weapons going, you know, billions dying. I mean, it would just be insane uh, to even imagine. The worst scenario ever. So to avoid the big ones, the big war, the big, the big World War III, in other words, to avoid that, we have all these little wars around the world to where the Soviets and the Americans can go at each other. The, the communists and the Americans, the West and the East can fight all over the globe, literally every continent, without actually having the big one. That's why it's a Cold War. It wasn't fought in winter, as I've actually seen someone say. No, it's nothing to do with that. Uh, please, God, don't put it out on an exam or something, please. Um, uh, it has to do specifically with no big war, no big bombs, no World War III, uh, but still pretty much continual global warfare. All right, the last thing we'll talk about is John F. Kennedy. 1960, John F. Kennedy gets elected. He runs against uh, Nixon, runs against Nixon. He barely wins. 49.7% of the vote to 49.5. He wins by 0.2%. Kennedy had a youthful appearance. Uh, public First public debates for an election. He wore makeup to look better on TV. Nixon refused to do that. So, yeah, he really, uh, his appearance and his demeanor, his youth, was appealing. He barely won the popular vote. People were attracted to his youthful, attractive, the whole candidacy of it, his sort of his uh, perfect marriage. They even came to call it like Camelot, reference to like King Arthur and perfection. And anyway, um, he brought in a whole new br uh, bunch of young, well-educated people into the White House, federal government. He was Democrat, and he was also our only Catholic president. He was Catholic, barely won the election. Uh, so certainly was a little bit different. And his entire presidency was full of crises, one after another after another. He gets no peace. Uh, the appearance also was, was deceiving on the outside. He was actually a drug addict. He had had injuries in his youth. He, uh, he was taking multiple medications. Um, he had discretions all the time. He cheated on Jackie Kennedy, I get Marilyn Monroe and stuff like this. He was he was a philanderer, I think is the right word to use, and a playboy. Um, he drank, he did drugs, he did a lot of the stuff behind the scenes. He was an elitist, and he was he was generally sort of a party boy. Um, imagine a frat boy becoming president. It's sort of like that. Uh, it doesn't say he was a bad president. He just was not, at least publicly, he appeared to be perfect. He had this this image of perfection. He they cultivated this image. His entire family did. The Kennedys did. They cultivated this image of perfection, even though behind the scenes it was far from it. However, if you really want to break down and examine the lives of most presidents behind the scenes, this was actually probably more common than not. Presidents, public figures in general, often portray this perfect image. Yet behind the scenes, it is far from perfect. So. Maybe we just know more about Kennedy because, of course, what happens to him and the whole tragedy of his, his presidency and, and the attention he gets from the public. He was the most public, the most uh, scrutinized, the most uh, media attention received of any president up to this point in time. Maybe that's why we knew so much more about him. Other presidents just got away with stuff in secret. Hard to know. In 1961, or after he became president, he followed through on the invasion of Cuba. We had already set up an invasion of Cuba under Eisenhower. It was put into effect. The plan of action was put into effect. And then Kennedy goes ahead and goes through with it, uh, what Eisenhower had already set up. And he authorizes it. Uh, it's a Soviet-controlled state of... Uh, okay, Cuba's not Soviet-controlled. That's wrong to say that. But Cuba is, is communist sympathizing, communist uh, state, and it is this belief that if we can overthrow Castro, we can free Cuba from communism. Very important. I mean, Cuba's nine miles off our border. 
we are worried about fighting and winning against communism around the world. And we can't even protect a little island that's like spitting distance from us, from communism. What's that say about our global containment strategy? I mean, right off our borders, you can stand in Key West and see Cuba, and we can't even protect it from communism. So it really says it's really a shameful for America's uh, Cold War policies. 1961, this is known as the, invasion, the Bay of Pigs invasion. It's known as the Bay of Pigs invasion. It's a fiasco. The Cuban military, the Cuban government finds out about it. They stop it immediately. They capture or kill all the invaders. You have a lot of Cuban nationals who are trying to overthrow Castro. Uh, American military soldiers uh, were assisting it. And they're all captured or killed. Um, Castro goes on television and, of course, announces to the entire world that uh, the U.S. just tried to invade and take over my con our country. Yeah, it looks really bad. And the Kennedy, though, does something which surprises many, which really does say something about his character. He goes on national television and takes blame for the whole thing and apologizes, takes blame for it, apologizes to Cuba, apologizes to the world, and says it was an error, it was a mistake. Um, that was also surprising. I think a lot of presidents would have never done that. He did. He did indeed. Well, that's just... Uh, Tragedy number one. Then the Berlin blockade. Remember back in 40, goodness, what was it, 47, the Berlin airlift? Uh, Stalin surrounded Berlin to try and cut us off and get us to, to leave Berlin. Uh, we refused. Eventually, after a year, we were successful. Well, sensing that Kennedy is weak, sensing, because he was young, I think he was one of our youngest presidents ever, maybe the youngest president ever. I think he was elected like 39. Uh, he was young. Uh, they thought he was inexperienced. He wasn't that inexperienced. He'd actually been in the military. He'd been an officer. Uh, World War II, I believe, he'd been an officer. And so he wasn't entirely inexperienced, but he really didn't have a lot of political experience, and he seemed weak. So the Soviets decided to take advantage of it. Uh, they go after Berlin again, believing this time it's going to work. They're going to force America to back out. They... Uh, they uh, blockade West Berlin, stop tra travel again. We sent over 40,000 American troops to Western Europe and to Western Germany, and we openly supported Berlin, and eventually the Berlin blockade does collapse again. Another failure for the Soviets to get Berlin back. I mean, it's a little small thing, but in this contest of wills between the East and West, every small thing is a small thing. It's, it's a victory, nonetheless. It is a victory. Then, in 1961, later in 61, the communist government of East Germany, which is controlled by the Soviet Union, controlled by Moscow, builds an actual wall. And the purpose of the wall is to stop people from the East going to the West. This is a common route for people from Eastern Europe to escape communism. Because you couldn't get through much of the border of the Iron Curtain, which is a metaphor, but yet it's a figurative, whatever, I guess both. Uh, because it wasn't like a physical barrier. But through most of the east-west border, you would find checkpoints, blockades, barbed wire, military bases. It was difficult to get out of Eastern Europe. It really was. Well, one of the ways people would do it, go through Berlin. Because all you had to do was get from East Berlin to West Berlin. And in some cases, you could literally just walk over. And then once you were in West Berlin, you could get on a plane out of, out of Eastern Europe. You could actually fly to Western, the Western world. So they decide to stop this. They build a physical wall separating all of Berlin. Uh, and they, they continue building this wall in other ways. They build walls, barbed wire, trenches, fences, all across Europe, almost physically cutting Europe in half, making it almost impossible to get out of Eastern Europe. Uh, really, really tough. Um, and this becomes a symbol to the entire world of Eastern oppression, communist oppression, violence, and exploitation and uh, of Eastern European. Well, keeps going. The next year we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. We find out that secretly the Soviets are shipping missiles to Cuba. They're shipping potentially nuclear-headed, nuclear warhead missiles to Cuba. Uh, secretly, of course. And Cuba had been building all these military missile installations in northern Cuba. Here's the deal, of course. If, if the Soviet Union was able to install military, uh, uh, install nuclear missiles in Cuba, it would be equivalent of holding a gun to the U.S.'s head. 
because he would be able to launch those missiles at the U.S., and they could literally decimate the entire southern United States in a matter of minutes. There would be no mutually assured destruction. We wouldn't even be able to retaliate. Half of the U.S. would be destroyed before we'd even be able to fire our first missile. 90 miles away, these missiles could travel to places like Miami in minutes. So this is, of course, you cannot be allowed. So we blockade Cuba. We send our boats out, our, our Navy, to actually intercept and stop the ships. Apparently, our CIA is working overtime here because we know exactly what ships are coming over. We know which ships have the missiles. Uh, we blockade Cuba. We stop the ships. It becomes a huge crisis. Some historians say this is the place. And again, I haven't done extensive studying of this, but I have read that some historians believe this was probably the closest we actually got to mutually assured destruction. We were minutes away from pushing the button. Uh, we were, JFK did everything but promise to fire nukes at the Soviets. He threatened war. He threatened he would have to invade and destroy Cuba, uh, which, of course, the Soviets said would force them to, because Cuba was an ally, so they would have to, of course, retaliate. We were minutes away from World War III. Uh, and the Soviets backed down. They eventually turned their ships around and go back. And uh, JFK wins. He wins this confrontation. It was certainly the ultimate uh, show of, of force from the United States and really the ultimate show of force from the Soviets. Uh, Going to place uh, nuclear-headed warhead missiles 90 miles off our coast. Um, it would have changed everything. It would have changed everything had they been able to do that successfully. So we would have had no choice but to go to war or to invade and take over Cuba. It would have been required. To take over those military bases, it would have had to have been immediate too. It would have been uh, this would have been a whole the world would be a different place today, literally a different place had the Soviets not turned around, turned the ships around, um, or if they had somehow actually done it secretly, if they'd actually managed to get the missiles installed without our knowledge. Yeah, but he did stop it. And ironically enough, relations actually improve afterwards. I think it becomes pretty clear what the Soviets respect is might and force and power. And Kennedy proves between Berlin and between the missile crisis that he is willing to use his military force and might and that he is not going to back down. And the Soviets seem to respect that. They seem to respect that show of force. And afterwards, relations actually improved through the rest of the 60s. We actually see Soviet-American relations lessen and calm down a little bit for, for most of the 60s. Well, what else did Kennedy do? Kennedy instituted all kinds of new policies in the 60s. He created the Peace Corps. I don't know if anyone uh, is joined the Peace Corps. You, you probably haven't at this point because I think you have to have a bachelor's degree. But Peace Corps is still a real thing. The Peace Corps is part of the Cold War uh, anti-Soviet uh, containment. What it was was we were going to send out people from America, college graduates, educated people to go and train and educate the rest of the world on the uh, benefits of the United States, benefits of democracy. Meanwhile, building hospitals, clean water systems, building schools. We are going to really teach the world that you want to be friends with America, that America and democracy is good, that the idea of American democracy and capitalism is a good thing, that we want to befriend you. Uh, it's almost... It's almost like bribery. It really is. It's almost a form of bribery to give the rest of the world, especially the third world, the developing world we call today, an anti-communist uh, option. Your option isn't depression and poverty or communism. Your option is a third option, us. We can be that answer to your depression and your, uh, your, your poor economy. Let the U.S. come in and get involved, and we can certainly treat you better than the Soviets. So this was another tactic in the Cold War containment strategy, uh, showing our compassion and our assistance. Uh, Africa, Asia especially is where we focused. We focused most of our energies of the Peace Corps on Africa and the Asian continents, which were the places the Soviets were expanding, was Africa and Asian territories. Another thing, of course, is the space race. In the 1950s, the Soviets kicked our ass in the space race. First man in space, first animal, first ship, first satellite. They got us in every way in the 1950s. 
Kennedy promises to fix that. He promises to rectify the situation. He authorizes the creation of the National Aeronautic Space Administration, NASA. Authorizes the creation of NASA, which is created, in, I think, in about 62. Um, um, that happens. He also promises in 1961 publicly, we will put a man on the moon in, I think it says 10 years. Uh, we do it in seven. Uh, he, prom he promises this in 62. We put the first man on the moon in 69. I think an Apollo mission. Was that an Apollo mission? Nonetheless, we do it in 1969. Just had the anniversary of that. Just had the, the 50th anniversary of putting a man on the moon. We do it first. He promises to do it in 10. We did it in 7. Now, he wasn't around to see it. Um, uh, spoiler alert. Yes, he is. Uh, he's assassinated uh, in 63 in uh, Dallas, Texas. He's killed. So... Um, that's where it ends up there with Kennedy. We won't really talk about Kennedy anymore. Kennedy is incredibly important as a president, and had he managed to actually stay in power, we would have probably seen a lot of things different. He was a liberal Democratic president, and his brother was already gearing up to run. His brother does run later and is also assassinated while running for president. The, the uh, people who do it don't even allow him to get there. Um, who knows if we would have won? But I think he was running for president in 68. He's assassinated. Kennedy's assassinated in 63. Uh, this was a period in the 60s of assassinations of prominent figures on the liberal left, on the more liberal Democratic side. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was assassinated. So we see a lot of attacks in the 1960s having to do with civil rights advocacy. And that was probably the reasons for the attacks on Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, of course. And we're not sure the reasons for JFK. It's still a bit of a mystery. Why? Because the guy who killed JFK is almost immediately himself assassinated. So we never really found out what his motivation was. But it certainly could have been had to do with civil rights, civil rights issues because John F. Kennedy did get involved in civil rights as well before he was killed. So, And then the last thing we'll look at here is the map. Uh, Bay of Pigs fiasco here. Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, is that even on here? Uh, the Soviet missile sites, you see them here. Could you imagine if they had managed to emplace nuclear missiles right here? The entire southern U.S. could have been saturated with nuclear missiles in a matter of minutes. It would have been exactly the same as the Soviets literally holding a loaded, loaded gun to our head. Uh, it would have been crazy. Uh, the power the Soviets would have had. We would have been left with no option then to invade and take over Cuba. It would have had to have happened, which would have been tough necessarily. We had a military base right there. And I mean, what would have it taken us to really, it would have been just insane. International incident, uh, unlike anything we'd ever seen before. Nonetheless, that's where our chapter ends. Thanks for going through with me. I know it's longer than normal, but still remember. This would have been at least a three-hour lecture in class. So, hey, only two hour 12 gives you plenty of time to study and answer the discussion question. And uh, you're still probably going to spend less time than commuting to school and sitting through lecture. Peace out.